Hello everyone and welcome to lecture 4 of grassallergies.com. I'm Dr. Jason Cayley, Clinical Immunology and Allergy, practicing in Toronto, Ontario. Now, this is where we get to the really fun stuff because I'm sure you're here to figure out what are grass allergies and what are the symptoms and if there's anything we can do to treat these symptoms or avoid them altogether. Now, we're going to be talking in this lecture about seasonal allergies and when they come out. So, if we look at a graph of northeast U.S. and Canada, we see that in March, April, and May, the trees start pollinating. The level of pollens that are out there usually directly corresponds one-to-one -to, -one to the degree of symptoms that you have. In the same geographic area, starting around May, June, and July, you have grass pollen that comes out. Now, there are many, many species of grass out there, and you can actually figure out how to identify the different types of grass, things like that. But suffice it to say, they usually pollinate around this time. Just like with other pollens, the level of allergen out there usually responds, or corresponds, I should say, directly to the degree of symptoms that one experiences. Following grass, which dissipates near the end of July, early August, you have ragweed that starts up. Ragweed peaks in August and September. Now, as there is decaying vegetation out there, from March to the first frost, there's usually a buildup of outdoor molds that can exist. These are the seasonal allergens. We're going to be talking about symptoms of allergies now. So, regardless of the type of inhalant allergy you have, the symptoms tend to be very similar. Some people have both year-round allergies, so allergies to something like dust, plus allergies to grass pollen. So these patients will typically notice a peak or worsening of their symptoms in June and July, corresponding to when the grass pollens are out. Some patients, if they're unlucky, will have allergies to various different pollens causing symptoms throughout the year. So Symptoms of allergies. The symptoms that you experience with allergies depends on the site that the allergen has made it to. So, if allergen makes it to your eyes, you'll experience itchy eyes, watery eyes, red eyes. Occasionally, you'll even get eyelid swelling and inflammation within the whites of the eye, or conjunctiva we call it. Very, very rarely, this can result in a serious ocular eye condition. If you experience any grittiness of the eyes, light sensitivity, a lot of discharge coming out of your eyes, or any discharge that's out of keeping with normal, please go see your doctor. Now, let's talk about the nose. So if you inhale the allergen through the nose, you will get nasal congestion, rhinorrhea, which is a runny nose, trains of sneezing, which is like, achoo, achoo, achoo. Some people will get post-nasal drip or itchiness at the back of their throat. Post-nasal drip, it often manifests itself as throat clearing, like, <clears throat> like that. One of the complications that can result of allergic rhinitis is predisposing you to a sinus infection. With increased mucus production in the nose and a stuffy nose, aka nasal congestion, the normal drainage patterns within the nose and the sinuses can get blocked up or misdirected. If you suspect you have a sinus infection, please go see your clinical immunologist, allergist, otolaryngologist, or primary care physician to see if you need further treatment. Now, if the allergens hit the lungs, this manifests as wheezing, chest tightness, shortness of breath, exercise limitation, and other symptoms associated with asthma. Coughing can often result as a direct result of how it affects the lungs or as a result of post-nasal drip. We call this upper airway cough syndrome if it happens from the nose or cough variant asthma if you have none of the other symptoms of asthma but predominantly cough. If you have asthma, 
it's important to have asthma controlled and again I would encourage you to seek professional medical guidance on this. Sometimes patients with eczema may also get contact urticaria so if you rub against the grass you may get some hives that result. Um, this is more rare but definitely possible. So grass pollen is largely airborne. So what can we really do to avoid this? Well, it is very difficult to avoid altogether. For the eyes, I guess you could go out wearing goggles, but oftentimes a more practical measure is to wear wraparound sunglasses to try to block out some of the pollen from getting in. Wearing a mask for the nose and the mouth is much harder to do, however, as you know, most people don't like to walk around with these things. Not really the socially in thing to do. As such, we try to take as many practical measures as possible. Some of this may include keeping your windows closed in your car, making sure you have filters in your car that trap pollen, keeping your windows closed in the summer, and using air conditioning instead. I don't think it's very practical for me to advise patients to stay indoors all the time and as such eventually uh, you will get exposed to grass pollen. So I know that's not the most helpful thing you wanted to hear there but really it is hard to avoid these airborne allergens. Now we talked a little bit about overlap patients, patients who have both year-round and seasonal allergies. So if we break this apart into a pie graph, uh, we will see that approximately 79-80% will have seasonal allergies and 21% will have year-round allergies. Of those who have seasonal allergies, about one in half, or I should say one in two, will have grass allergies. Now the grass pollen season can vary from week to week from the usual historical norms. Most states and provinces have pollen counters in various parts of the city that can detect and tell you roughly what the pollen counts are for your local area. So we talked about grass allergies, allergy symptoms, and some practical things that we can do to try to limit our exposure. In the next lecture we're going to talk about other things that we can do to treat or manage our symptoms. Some of the interventions I'm going to talk to you about in Lecture 6 called Allergen Immunotherapy is potentially what we call disease modifying or another way of looking at it is potentially curative.